Welcome to Virtual Worship at Trinity Lutheran Church. This is the worship service for Sunday, October 30th, 2022. The last Sunday in October on the Lutheran calendar is always the Sunday that we remember the day that Martin Luther nailed the 95 theses on the church door in Wittenberg, Germany, and set off what would become known as the Protestant Reformation. Luther rediscovered the truth of the gospel, the gospel being the good news about Jesus. Luther rediscovered that the gospel really is good news. It's not good advice, it's good news. Something is different. In fact, everything is different in the world because of the coming of Jesus. That Jesus came into the world to set us free. To set us free from sin, to set us free from the power of death, to set us free from the power of religious obligation. To set us free to have a deep relationship of love and joy with God. So that's what we'll be remembering today. We have events Coming up in the church, also on this Reformation Sunday, we will be welcoming new members. That's always a great thing. We haven't done that for a long time. Uh, in fact, we really haven't done it since COVID happened. But we have, uh, we have that opportunity to say welcome to people who are joining our community this Sunday. Next weekend, the traditional TLC, Trinity Lutheran Church Marketplace, time where we open the building to crafters from the community, people show off the, the beautiful things that they have made and uh, opportunity to, to purchase those things, support people in our community. Also, we have uh, attic treasures or maybe garage treasures, things that you know people had in their homes that they didn't have any use for but may just be something perfect for you or one of your grandchildren. It does work out that way quite often. And you're also welcome to join us in the cafe to enjoy some traditional Trinity recipes. Oh, com coming up in the not-too-distant future is Advent. Uh, it's already the end of October. First Sunday in Advent is November 27th, and so we're kind of already thinking about the Advent conspiracy, our traditional time of, instead of buying a gift for somebody that really doesn't need a gift, making a donation in their honor and uh, supporting a good cause like a well for people that don't have clean drinking water or the Cornerstone Foundation right here in Rockville that helps people in need with shelter and food. So that's, that's coming up. Those opportunities for generosity will be here soon. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. First reading is from Jeremiah, chapter 31, verses 31 to 34. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. A covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another or say to each other, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. Word of God, word of life. The Holy Gospel comes among us in the words of St. Luke, the 19th chapter. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through it. A man was there named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. He was trying to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd he could not because he was short in stature. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore tree to see him, because he was going to pass that way. When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, 
for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried down and was happy to welcome him. All who saw it began to grumble and said, He has gone to be the guest of one who is a sinner. Zacchaeus stood there and said to the Lord, Look, half of my possessions, Lord, I will give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will pay back four times as much. Then Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek out and to save the lost. This is the Gospel of the Lord. As I said, today is Reformation Sunday, hence the red shirt. Red is the color of the Holy Spirit, and we believe that the Holy Spirit was active in the Reformation, leading people to reform the church and present the good news of Jesus more authentically and more clearly. So what is the good news? What is the gospel? The gospel, N.T. Wright, one of the top New Testament scholars in the world would say, the gospel is news. It's not advice, it's news. The gospel describes something that happened that changes the present and also opens up new possibilities for the future. It's not advice. It is not suggestions about how to live. It is not a list of things that you ought to do in order to get into heaven or anything else. It's news. News such as a man runs into a cafe and says, good news, I have the most amazing good news. This is incredible news. I'm so grateful that this happened. And then he proceeds to tell about how his young daughter, who was in the hospital and it looked like she was terminally ill and had an incurable disease, was cured, was given a second chance at life. And that's good news. It's news because it's something that happened and it opens up new possibilities. It changes lives. Obviously, it changes the, the little girl's life, but it changes the man's life, too. It changes the lives of everybody in that family. The gospel is good news. N.T. Wright tells a story illustrating how the good news can sometimes be difficult to communicate uh, and difficult for other people to, uh, to recognize as, as important. He was in uh, Atlanta. Now, N.T. Wright is from, is from Great Britain. He was, in, he was in Atlanta for a Bible Scholars Conference. And during that conference, the World Cup rugby uh, tournament was being played. And England was playing against Australia for the World Cup in the final, you know, in the final match. And of course, this is going on across time zones, so it's, you know, four in the morning in Atlanta, and surprise, surprise, even in 2003, with all the different stations that were available, rugby wasn't on TV in Atlanta. Nobody cared, so it wasn't on TV. So he calls his daughter back in England and says, what's going on with the game? What's going on with the game? And she says, ah, oh, ah, oh, it's, it's, they, it's, it's, they, played, um, they played, played four quarters, the time's up, they're tied 17 to 17, they're gonna add an extra half hour of play. So the excitement builds, you know, this is, this is a big deal. England versus Australia for the World Cup rugby. And he, he's not going back to sleep at this point, he goes down to the lobby, he calls his daughter again, what's going on, what's going on? And, he's, and she says, in the last, 30 seconds of the game, Johnny Wilkerson, who is like the rugby guy, who at that time was like the rugby guy in England, scored a goal and won the game. And of course, 
everybody in England is just ecstatic. I mean, you know, it's like the way people around here get when the Yukon women win the win the national championship. Or it would be the way that uh, people around here would be if the Yukon women won the national championship after they had lost for like 10 years in a row and finally won again. It would be, it would be like that. Just excitement, joy, uh, people, feeling, people feeling really great about it. Little kids deciding, yes, I want to be a rugby player like Johnny Wilkerson. So this is news, right? This is big news. N.T. Wright has this big news. But of course, it's five o'clock in the morning in Atlanta where he has this big news and nobody cares. You know, is he going to go up to the, you know, to the person at the, at the front desk and say, England won the World Rugby Cup, England, they're going to be like, uh, who cares? So what? Doesn't matter. You know, and N.T. Wright, he wants to share this with somebody, so, you know, he's at a Bible Scholars Conference, so there's people there from all over the world. But when, you know what, the first person that he sees that would care about this game is somebody from Australia. And of course, N.T. Wright's from England, he's thrilled that the, that, that, that the English team won. But the Australian guy whose team lost, uh, especially in the last 30 seconds of overtime, he is not feeling good at all. This is not good news for him. And see, sometimes I think we think of the, of the gospel like that, that the gospel is about winners and losers, and, so, and that for some people, the gospel is not good news at all. But the truth is, is that the gospel is good news for everybody. The good news that Jesus came into the world, that God took on human flesh to come into our world to show us God's unlimited love, that Jesus was even willing to die on a cross to suffer for us, to show us that there is nothing that God would not go through in order to prove that God loved us, to show us that God could deal with the worst that humanity had to offer. That God, God could deal with the worst punishment, the worst insults that humanity would, would hurl at him, that would hurl on Jesus, and Jesus would still continue to love and forgive. And that even after they killed him, that was not the end of the story. But Jesus rose again to show that God's love and God's mercy are unconquerable and that they are for everyone. And when we internalize that news, when we, when we know that God has good intentions for us, good intentions for our lives, when we know that God's love for us means that God always wants the best for us, when we know the way this story is going to end ultimately in goodness and life, that truth and that good news can be transformational. I mean, when we really internalize it, it is transformational. And see, it's not good advice. It's not, if you do X, then you'll be acceptable to God. Or you know what? In order for God to really like you, you should do Y. That's, that's not the way it works. The gospel is good news that once we really hear it, once we really accept it, will change who we are, will change the way that we see the world, and will change the way that we live in the world. Zacchaeus, I think, is one of the best examples of the transforming power of the gospel as news. Not as advice, but as news. Here's Zacchaeus, a tax collector, somebody that everybody hates. And then, to kind of like add insult on top of it, he's short. Right? So he can't even see Jesus when he goes out to see Jesus. The people are standing in front of him, and nobody likes him, so they're not going to make way. Nobody's going to say, oh, Zacchaeus, you can't see over us. Come on, come in front of us so you can see Jesus pass by and maybe, and maybe speak to him. Nobody does that. So Zacchaeus has to run on his stubby little legs ahead of Jesus, climb a tree. Imagine this rich, middle-aged guy climbing a tree in a robe. 
It's not dignified. It's not dignified at all. It probably looks pretty darn silly. And there is Zacchaeus hanging on to this branch in the tree. And as Jesus comes by, Jesus looks up and sees him and says, Zacchaeus, come out of that tree. I'm coming to your house today. And that's probably the last thing that Zacchaeus expected. Zacchaeus probably expected, oh, well, the rabbi, the teacher, the prophet, he's, he's going to scold me, right? He's going to tell me, you're a tax collector, Zacchaeus. You are taking advantage of your fellow Israelites. You are stealing from your fellow Israelites. That's wrong. You need to stop that. You need to give that up. But Jesus doesn't say that. What Jesus says is Jesus says, Zacchaeus, essentially what Jesus says through, through, his, through inviting himself to, to Zacchaeus' house and through going to Zacchaeus' house, what Jesus says very clearly is, Zacchaeus, you are loved. You are valued. I, I want to be the recipient of your hospitality, which in that culture was an honor, right? If you had a if you had an honored rabbi or teacher come to your house, that was an honor. I mean, just like today, if if um, you know somebody famous and respected, and I know I can't say somebody in particular because in our culture it's it's tough to pick it, pick somebody that everybody likes, but you know somebody somebody famous, respected, honored, and they and, and they say, hey, I would like to I would like to come over to your house for dinner. What would we say? We'd say, oh, that's wonderful. It would be. We would even say it would be an honor. Well, in, in Jesus' culture, in the culture of Jesus' time, that's even more true. Somebody showing up, somebody of stature and who was respected showing up at your house conveyed, conveyed a lot of honor. And Jesus goes to Zacchaeus' house. No strings attached. And people grumble about it. People say, what's he doing going to that sinner's house? How could he possibly go to that person's house? That guy is just evil. But Jesus goes. And when Jesus comes into the house, when the presence of Christ shows up for Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus is changed. Zacchaeus realizes what Jesus is saying to him without any words. Jesus is saying to Zacchaeus, I care about you. You are loved. You are accepted. And when Zacchaeus has that experience, when, Jesus, when, when Zacchaeus experiences that good news, he's transformed. He says, you know what, Jesus? Half of everything that I have, all this money that I made over the years fleecing people, half of it I'm giving to the poor. And you know what? If I defrauded anybody, I'm going to pay them back four times as much. Which really means Zacchaeus is going to have next to nothing left because just about every dime Zacchaeus made was defrauding people because that's the way the tax system worked, if you remember. The way the tax system worked is the Romans would say, you have to collect $100 from these people and anything else you could fleece out of them, you get to keep in your pocket. So that's the way Zacchaeus made all his money. And Zacchaeus is basically saying, this incredible good news that I am accepted by God, that I am loved by Jesus himself. All these other things don't matter anymore. They don't matter. The money doesn't matter. It's the relationships that matter. It's the relationship with God. I'm gonna, and, and Zacchaeus is like, well, I can't fix everything, but at least I can do this. I can try to repair some of the wrong that I've done. And Jesus says, truly salvation has come to this house. And see, by that, I don't think Jesus is saying, okay, Zacchaeus, you, you did the right thing. You know, you punched your ticket. Now you get to go to heaven. Because salvation is a much, much bigger word. Just like the gospel is a much, much bigger word than just a uh, get out of hell free card. Salvation is wholeness and healing and reconnection 
with others, reconnection with life. And Jesus says, that's what's happening. That's what's happening. He says, because Zacchaeus, you're still a son of Abraham. You're still part of the family. You're still loved. That's an incredible transformation. That's an incredible change that happens when Zacchaeus recognizes the good news. And brothers and sisters, the good news is that good for us as well. You know, Zacchaeus could see it really clearly. He was ostracized. People hated him. He was pushed aside. So the good news that Jesus accepted him, the good news that God was welcoming him back into the family, that he was still a son of Abraham, that's incredible stuff. It's kind of obvious in his case. Maybe it's not always so obvious for us. Maybe it's not so obvious for us that we need salvation, that we need healing in our lives, that we need wholeness to be returned to our lives. We need healing in our relationships. We need a reconnection with and a deeper connection with God. But if we think about it, who among us does not need those things? Who among us would not benefit from those things? And the good news is that those gifts are ours because Jesus has come into the world to give us life, to give us wholeness, to give us salvation. Jesus has come. Jesus does live in us. It's not just the good news about Jesus. It's the good news of Jesus because Jesus is still living out that story in the church, in me, in you. Good news. Thanks be to God.
In gratitude and humility, let us join together in prayer on behalf of all of God's creation. And the response will be, your mercy is great. Keep your church steadfast in your word, reforming God. Deepen our faith and increase our love in Jesus' name. Further ecumenical dialogue and partnerships and equip us for unified witness and service in the world. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Come to the aid of the poor, especially those suffering food and water shortages or loss of homes due to natural disasters. Halt the exploitation of the earth's resources and lead us to seek justice and rescue the oppressed, especially in Yemen, Syria, Democratic Republic of Congo, and Myanmar. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Guide leaders of all nations, Almighty God. Heal divisions, build trust, and remove barriers that prevent collaboration and cooperation. Bring neighborhoods, cities, and countries together to work for the common good. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Save from trouble those who struggle with hunger, homelessness, or addiction. Strengthen the overworked and give hope to those who do not have enough work. Console those who are burdened by illness or grief, especially Horst and family, Michael, Kurt and Cindy, Julie, Lori, Vanessa, John, Jackie, Gerhard, Brianna and Eliana, Steve and Ellie, Joanne and Frank, Judy, Sapphire, Diane, Dwayne, Reese Ash family, Paul, Lynn Marie, Carol, Rhoda, Emily, Cheryl, Jason and family, Jean, Mike, Jamie, Josh, Maggie, Ed, Gail and Richard, Holly, Deb, Don, Wendy, Mark, Gildo, Dean, Aiden, Noreen, Helen, Marianne, Elvira, Jennifer, Megan, Ken, Kurt, Chris, Peter, Joan, Andrew, Gregory, Deanna, Ella, Noreen, Allen, Eva, Glenn, Michael, Liz, Jim, Jerry, Sarah, Sue, Dave, Carrie, Rudy, Emma, Dan, the Moore family, Carol, Veronica, Catherine, Sharon, Rose, Irene, Anne, Thomas, Bruce, Mariah, Dick and Judy, Lenny, Gail, the Page family, Mike, Phyllis, Marie, Roger, Cheryl, Sherelle, Elise, Dave, all of our shut-ins, the people of Shishmaref and all Alaskan villages. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. Reveal yourself to all who seek you. Empower the hospitality ministries of this congregation to welcome others to your feast of love. Foster generosity in our stewardship ministries to both our congregation and community. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Here, other intercessions may be offered. Gather the faithful at the table of your eternal banquet. We give thanks for those who have witnessed to your gracious presence, especially Ellie, Linda, Martin Luther, and all who strive to reform and renew the church. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. With grateful hearts, we commend our spoken and silent prayers to you, O God, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. 
Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Thank you for worshiping with us. As I often say at the end of these worship services, we continue to be the church together. Whether we gather on YouTube, gather in this building, or gather outside, or gather around somebody's kitchen table, when we gather together in Jesus' name, we are the church. And if there's any way that I or anybody in your church family can be helpful to you, please let me know. If there's any way that you feel that you could be a blessing to others through your church family, please let me know. And now may Almighty God, who raised again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, abundantly bless you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.